Thank, thank you very much, uh, Margarita. And I thank you so much, uh, Margarita. And, and thank you also to the to the previous speakers, Ilaria, Bettina, and, and Steen. I think it's really um, a pleasure to be here with you virtually. And um, I must say, after so many months of, of teleworking, I'm really envious uh, about uh, the possibility for you to meet in, in Bergamo. And I'm not, I'm sorry that I couldn't be I wasn't able to join you kind of um, for for real. So, um, but I'm very happy that there is the possibility actually of, of joining you uh, online. And it's really a pleasure um, to be with you at this very, very interesting, interesting conference. And I'm, I'm very glad that also, I think the the presentations really complement each, each other well. And that makes my my task really uh, much easier because I think the Ilaria, Bettina, and Steen have already uh, addressed um, quite a number a number of of issues that I also wanted to touch on, which is great because then I can I can um, address them a bit a bit more quicker. Um, and as you can see from the from the photo, I would also like to take you a bit on a on a more global global level. Um, so also um, think a bit more about uh, the global uh, perspective for, for social protection. So if I, sorry, it's always a challenge to find, find the right uh, button here. So I would like to structure my presentation in three um, big questions. Um, where do we stand? What is at stake? And what needs to, to change? And I'm very happy that I'm, I can also um, bring you some some of the recent uh, deliberations and conclusions also of the International Legal Conference, which is often called the Global uh, or the International Parliament uh, of Labour, which is actually, and this is very unusual, um, we are currently, I mean, today the deliberation of the International Labour Conference has, has started again. Normally it happens only end of May, beginning of June. But this year, because of the virtual setting, it was decided to have another session end of November, beginning of December. And uh, this is very timely, actually, because there's two working parties meeting at the moment. And one is on inequalities and the other one is on skills. So really kind of right, um, right in the middle of the, of the discussion um, that we're, we're having. But let me focus um, mostly on the question of social protection. and. Um, but I'll, I'll make some references also to the, to the broader um, context. So where do we stand? And uh, I think now, and I think several others, I mean, Bettina and, uh, and also Stine have, have referred to the fact how much uh, the um, COVID uh, pandemic has really changed the way how people look at social protection and also how, how policymakers look, look at social protection. And the crisis has really exposed very much um, the gaps in social protection systems. But at the same time, it has highlighted the key role that social protection systems play, um, not just in addressing crisis, but also in playing a role in, in protecting um, workers and people in more and more general terms um, every day. And I think one of the key um, lessons learned from the crisis was how much um, the automatic responses um, have played a key role through the existing social protection system. So we have seen that countries who had good social protection systems in place were able to respond much faster and much better uh, than countries for which this was not the case. And social protection has played a key role for protecting people's health, for protecting jobs and, and incomes. And I think that has come out also um, I think on all, all of the previous uh, presentation. And it has really also played a key role as an automatic stabilizer for the, for the economy. But at the same time, uh, and, and this is basically true for almost all countries around the world, um, they have taken emergency policy um, responses to close coverage and adequacy gaps. And focusing particularly on those categories of workers who were previously not or not adequately protected. And depending on really the pre-existing structures, they use both social insurance and tax finance schemes 
to improve what they what they had. And that has necessitated the very urgent mobilization of additional resources and uh, the kind of establishment of new delivery structures, quite a lot of uh, innovation we have seen in that in that um, context. And I think this is a very, very positive uh, message. But at the same time, uh, most of these measures were very temporary and, and in many cases these, these, they have already um, already ended. But that's um, really now also the, the question of what is going to happen happen now. Um, as we are now at this very critical crossroads. And just to illustrate um, some points, and uh, I mean, has, has already um, mentioned that, how much the poor social protection coverage for some categories of workers, and I'm focusing here on, on platform workers, using evidence from a recent ILO uh, report, this was the ILO World Employment and Social Outlook 2021, on digital labor platforms. So that was one of the uh, category, but um, many other um, categories of workers have been uh, very much, um, very much uh, affected and, and were finding themselves in a, in a very vulnerable situation. And uh, especially those who were already vulnerable before, but for whom uh, the crisis has even exacerbated those vulnerabilities. And this has to do, and then now I'm taking you really on a very, very global picture. And I'm I'm sorry for the fact that the the, the font is very is very small, but I'm I'm very happy to share also afterwards the, the presentation with, with you. Um, but the key challenge here looking at it from a global perspective is less than, not less than half of the global population is effectively covered by at least a minimum of social protection. And this indicator looks at the population who's covered by at least one social protection benefit. And, and globally, um, it is 46.9% um, only of the, of the global population. And if you look into, into some regions of the world, uh, particularly Africa and Asia and, and Pacific, um, the proportion of those covered in at least one area is even even much smaller. I mean, for example, in Africa, it's only it's less than one in five uh, people. And uh, I'm not going into into the detail now because of of the time. Um, but also looking at, I think it's it's quite interesting also to look at specific. Um, categories of the population, looking at children, looking at the situation of mothers with newborns, um, where only a minority um, are covered, covered globally. Um, looking at work injury, also looking at unemployment, which has become very much to the fore uh, in the context of the crisis, where globally only less than one in five um, workers receives unemployment unemployment benefits, sorry, one in five unemployed workers receives unemployment benefits. And this is mostly due to the fact that there are many countries um, globally who don't even have an unemployment uh, protection scheme. So there is a huge global challenge, but even if you look to Europe and Central Asia, um, the situation looks um, much better than in Africa and, and Asia and the Pacific, but even there um, we see quite significant um, gaps in social protection coverage. Um, and the same uh, is true and even more uh, dramatically when we look, uh, if we look at, at the adequacy of coverage. And if we look at the way how countries actually meet the minimum standards, which are set out in international social security um, standards. Um, so there is a huge challenge in that, in that respect. And uh, Sorry, I'm I'm skipping I'm skipping that that slide to go right to the to the next one. So no, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll just have one one key message from from this um, this section on the on the policy response, and uh, this is really a fact, and this is why the ILO is now um, in the um, the World Social Protection Report, uh, which has come out. Um, in, in September argues that countries are at a crossroads. I mean, on the one hand, um, policymakers have recognized how important social protection 
um, is for keeping um, a social contract, basically, and also, but also for for kind of economic uh, dynamism in in those in those countries. Um, but at the same time, uh, the fact um, that there are these huge coverage gaps, and there are also a number of pre-existing uh, challenges, and they go kind of much um, further back um, than uh, than COVID COVID nineteen. The um, labor market transformations that we have seen in, in recent years, which have uh, to some extent also undermined um, the, the social contract and have fractured the, the social contract. And this is now a very simplistic um, way of putting in some of the, some of the key words. Um, so we have, we have seen uh, that in many, in many ways, economic risks have been shifted to, to workers. Also, with the de-responsibilization of some enterprises, um, and in some sectors or in some areas of the economy, also we've seen we've seen unfair competition in that in that regard. We've seen the the consequences and the impl uh, the implications of fragmentation, disempowerment, and and quite often also in the in the discourse on on, on social protection. We have seen that in the discourse, flexibility and, and security um, have been discussed as kind of two opposite ends of the, of the discussion. So you can either choose social security or you can choose flexibility, but you cannot have both. And I think this is really um, uh, some of the core aspects of the, this kind of very much fractured uh, social contract. And so if we want to move towards a reinvigorated social contract, I think it's necessary really to uh, put those development into question and think about ways of addressing it. And maybe starting with the, the last point that I mentioned, um, I think there is a necessity to really shift the thinking um, to thinking about how social security is actually necessary and indispensable to support flexibility um, and decent work, and I think this uh, requires uh, an important shift uh, in thinking. I'm not going through the other points because I'm conscious about the, the time because we want to leave some time for the discussion at the at the end. Um, I think there is, and I think we have to um, look in a bit more kind of um, granularity also. And what are the, the challenges when it comes to social protection coverage? What are the reasons for those, for those coverage gaps? And I think Steen has um, already um, had a kind of an excellent discussion um, about, uh, about self-employment, which quite often um, lacks coverage or at least kind of lacks, lacks adequate, adequate coverage. But there are also challenges in some countries when it comes to some other forms uh, of employment, which are sometimes being called non-standard uh, forms of employment or diverse forms of employment. But this is not a kind of, it's not a natural law. Um, so sometimes it's being discussed as if everyone who was in temporary employment or in part-time employment was not covered, but this is certainly not the case. But there are certain um, elements um, that that are really critical in that in that respect. For example, when we talk about temporary employment, somehow someone who has a kind of a one-year contract uh, is in most countries quite likely to be to be covered. But if someone has uh, kind of really is in, in very short time or very kind of casual employment, there is uh, indeed a major a major challenge. And this challenge um, in some countries has to do with the with the fact that those workers are legally not covered. Uh, in other cases, um, it might be that they might be legally covered, but there is an issue about compliance. So I think it's really a combination, a combination of both. And we need to look very carefully because the situation of countries is, is, very, is very diverse. But, uh, but as I said, I think the social security coverage is particularly important for workers in those forms of employment. So, and I think this really points to the need uh, to address um, the non-coverage or uh, 
or the fact that quite often there the coverage is not is not adequate. And so what needs to, to change in that in that respect? And, uh, and as I mentioned before, um, the World Social Protection Report um, argues about this crossroad that countries are, are now in after, after COVID-19, um, being aware of, about the very important role of social protection systems, having now a very critical policy window for making those right choices regarding the future of their social protection systems. And the question is really, are countries going to move a kind of towards a high road, really towards strengthening their social protection systems, making sure that there's universal coverage uh, for workers in all types of employment, that benefit levels and other um, aspects of the other schemes are, are adequate, that there is a comprehensive range of benefits that the, the social um, protection schemes and systems are sustainably financed and equitably financed, um, that there is right space and inclusive provision, and also that the, the systems adapt to developments in the world of work. So this is really the high, the high road um, to um, social protection, really strengthening the, the social protection systems, uh, which is really at the core of a human-centered recovery. But at the same time, there are pressures, and there might be, I mean, political pressures, and especially there are fiscal pressures um, to follow a, a more minimalistic approach, which we have called a kind of a low road uh, approach, um, with continued underinvestment, austerity, fiscal um, consolidation policies, which are, um, which um, really kind of. Um, damage um, the, the, um, the capacity of the system to operate in, a, in an effective way. Um, limiting um, the social protection uh, systems and benefits to minimal benefits that are insufficient to ensure a dignified life for people. Um, forgetting about kind of the coordination with labor market employment and other relevant policies, which is so central and really leading to very uh, persistent large coverage gaps in, in social protection. And um, actually the, so, sorry, I'm, and I think there is a quite um, some evidence to see what works and what doesn't, which of the features uh, of schemes work and what does, but I'm going, I'm not going into, into that discussion because um, I'm running already late. So I'm going right to that point. Um, and uh, and uh, in terms of this this crossroads and taking the high road versus the low road, um, the International Labour Conference actually in its session in June uh, this year has actually come up with a very clear response to that to that question. And I think this is really a response uh, that very clearly points to uh, a high road uh, approach. To strengthening social protection systems, and I've put in the kind of the link to the to the conclusions that have been adopted, and also to the global call to action for a human-centered recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. So there has been a very clear call for reinforcing social protection systems, and and really developing universal social protection systems um, that do not offer not only offer coverage for everyone, but Thinking about adequate coverage and uh, being making sure that they're um, sustainably and equitably financed, so that they can really adequately respond um, to changes um, in the world of work and beyond, and enable people to navigate their work and life transitions, and importantly, also in the context of just transitions towards environmentally sustainable societies and economies. And I think one of the critical elements uh, that has been, that is part um, of that vision is ensuring adequate social protection for workers in all types of employment. And I think this very much speaks um, to the point uh, that Steen has made about the self-employed workers, really making sure that um, the schemes um, 
And this includes uh, both social insurance and tax fin finance benefits. That they also include um, self-employed workers and, and other um, workers in different types of employment. So that they're really inclusive, also considering that people move between those different uh, employment status uh, over their time. So if you have a very fragmented um, system or if you have gaps in coverage, this is really very um, detrimental to their, to their protection. So it's really about extending the system and making sure that everyone um, is part of that that system and uh, also contributes it to the to the extent uh, possible and uh, and benefits from from the social protection system. The point about legal certainty for workers and employers has also been reflected in the in the conclusions. And also um, emphasizing also uh, the importance of effective social dialogue um, and basing the social protection systems on principles of solidarity, con collective financing, a well-balanced intergenerational fairness and the achievement of, of gender equality. And I think it's important also to see um, those conclusions in a broader um, policy context um, that also looks at related uh, uh, policy areas and uh, including uh, employment policies and, and regulation, including the effective regulation of labor markets, uh, effective social dialogue, and also um, policies to support life and work transitions, including lifelong learning, health and care services, gender equality, and active labor market policies, and within a broader conducive um, policy environment. And I think at that point, um, I'll, uh, I'll leave it here, and thank you very much for your attention. I've added on the last slide a number of, uh, of links uh, with further information in case you're you're interested. So thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the discussion.